Good morning. morning. Welcome to Orange Coast Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Joel Ibanez, and I'm your worship associate today. And I'm joined by our guest musicians who are leading on behalf of Beth Syverson, our director of music ministries, uh, who is out today, and Karen Magoon Pearson, who is our director of religious education for children and youth, in welcoming you this morning. Our minister, Reverend Sean Wilshire, is not leading the service today, but she has a special message for you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Well, if all goes well, I am off to Scotland in just two days. I cannot wait. I have been waiting for this for four years. And okay, if you're a little bit jealous because I get to go to Scotland, it's only fair to point out to you that you get to have the wonderful Casey Pandell preaching to you this morning. So see, we're both going to have a fabulous time. Have a wonderful service, everyone. Okay. As Reverend Sean mentioned this morning, we are delighted to have Casey Pandell, who is our guest minister today. She will fill in at OCUUC a number of times this summer while Reverend Sean is on sabbatical. Casey is also serving as intern minister at Tapestry UU, a contract minister at UUC Anaheim, and will begin full-time ministry with the Summit Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Santee, California this fall. In addition, we would also like to recognize the many volunteers that have helped to put this service together today. OCUUC respectfully recognizes that our church property rests on Ahachimen and Tongva land. As Unitarian Universalists, we have many different beliefs, but we are one loving community. We are bound together not by a common set of rules or beliefs, but rather a covenant. A covenant is simply a promise, a promise that whatever our beliefs, we accept one another and encourage each other in spiritual growth. We affirm that all life has inherent value and that all existence is interconnected. We strive for justice and compassion in our deeds and relationships, and we are committed to creating uh, creating a welcoming community without regard to the traits that sometimes divide people. To our roomers, we invite you to silence your cell phones. And for our Zoomers, we invite you to say hello in the chat. I want to extend a special welcome to visitors if you are seeking a spiritual home. We hope that you will find it here. Later in the service, we will have an opportunity for you to introduce yourself if you'd like to do so. And we will go ahead and begin our worship with the lighting of our chalice. This morning, I'd like to invite Sonny Harper up here to light our chalice. Sonny has been a member of OCUUC since 1986 for the last 37 years. And as she lights the chalice, let us say our unison affirmation together. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to help one another, this we affirm together. Okay, please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our opening song. Welcome to this circle where love and grace abound. We honor your journey and wherever you are bound. We will walk beside you, encourage you on your way. Celebrate your spirit and hold you as we pray. There is love for one like you. There is grace enough to see you through. And wherever you have walked, 
whatever path you choose. May you know there is love for one like you. Spirit and hold you as we pray. There is love for one like you. There is grace enough to see you through. And wherever you have walked, whatever path you choose, may you know. Good morning, everyone. My name is Casey Marie Pandell. It is my honor and joy to be here with you today to worship, and a couple more weeks after this, too. Our call to worship this morning comes from our Unitarian Universalist ancestor, Hope Johnson, entitled, We Are One. We are one a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits, here not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. We are active and proactive. We care deeply. We live our love as best we can. We are one, working, eating, laughing, playing, singing, storytelling, sharing, and rejoicing, getting to know each other, taking risks, opening up, questioning, seeking, searching, trying to understand, struggling, making mistakes, paying attention, asking questions, listening, living our answers, learning to love our neighbors, learning to love ourselves apologizing and forgiving with humility, and being forgiven through grace, creating our beloved community together. We are one. You are whole, you are holy, you are loved, and you are so welcome here. Welcome to worship. Talmud of the Jewish tradition, the sage Hillel said, what is hateful to you, do not to others. This is the whole of the law. All the rest is commentary. In the Hindu legend of Mahabharata, the divine Krishna declared, this is the sum of duty. Do nothing unto others which would cause you pain if done to you. 
It is written. It is taught. May it be so. Gospel of Matthew in the Christian scriptures, the Messiah Jesus says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. In the Buddhist text of the Ardhanavarga, the student is urged, hurt not others in the ways that you yourself would find hurtful. It is written, it is taught, may it be so. Muslim hadith of al-Nawawi, the prophet Muhammad teaches, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. In the Taishang treatise of Taoism, the, the seeker is instructed, regard your neighbor's gain as your gain and your neighbor's loss as your own loss. It is written, it is taught, may it be so. Many windows were locked, many waters were seen. All lifted hearts are free. In the ancient wisdom of Shinto, there is a saying, the heart of the person before you is a mirror. See there your own form. The Oglala, Oglala Lakota spiritual leader Black Elf, Elk wrote, There all things are our relatives. What we do to everything we do to ourselves. It is written, it is taught, may it be so. Okay, it's time for a time for all ages. If we could have Karen Magoon Pearson come up. She's going to give us a little story. Good morning. Good morning. So since we're talking about spiritual education this morning, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about one of our four parents of religious education for Unitarian Universalists. Uh, Sophia Lyon Foss. That's her on the slide. I want to see what she looks like. Mama, Mama, why do we just keep going and going and never going anywhere? asked little Sophie. Her family was crossing the wide Pacific Ocean on a big ship bound for America. Sophie Lyon was an American girl, three and a half years old, making her first trip to America. And she and her older brothers and sisters had all been born in China where their father was an evangelical Christian minister and their mother had started a school for Chinese girls. When they made that long trip to America in 1880, Sophie's parents thought their family would go back to China in about a year, but the plans changed and Sophie never returned to China. And as she grew up, her memories of China grew dim, but she hoped when she grew up, she could go to other countries as a Christian teacher, just like her parents did. So in college, Sophie joined a club for young people who also wanted to become Christian teachers. She met another devoted volunteer named Harvey Foz, 
and they began writing letters to each other and made plans to travel and teach together. Six years later, they were married. But instead of traveling to another country, Sophie and Harvey moved to New York City. Harvey had a job, and Sophia Lyon Foz taught Sunday school and continued her studies, excited about the new ideas she was learning. Then Sophia and Harvey's first child was born in 1904, and in those days, a lot of women gave up their outside work when they became mothers. But Sophia was determined to keep learning and to keep teaching Sunday school, so she did. And it turned out that being a mother also helped Sophia learn. She learned about children from being with her own children, and listening to their ideas and their questions was really inspiring to her. When her children asked questions, Sophia tried her best to answer them. And her children had very interesting questions, like, where does snow come from? And where are we before we are born? And as she tried to answer her, her children's questions, Sophia learned how much she did not know. You might think that not having all the answers took away Sophia's faith, but instead it was the opposite. She started to believe that having a strong faith and finding questions you really care about is just as important as finding the answers. So one time when Sophia taught a religious education class, she told a lively story about a real person who had been a Christian teacher in another country. And the children were eager to hear the story and eager to talk about it. So just like her own children at home, the children asked questions the interesting kind of questions that let Sophia knew that they were thinking and learning. So Sophia's ideas about religion changed over time. When she was a young person, she thought Christianity was the one true religion and people all over the world should learn Bible stories. But then she grew to realize the Bible wasn't the only book with truth in it. And so she collected stories from all over the world filled with truth and beauty to help children's spirits stretch and grow. And she published the stories in a book called From Long Ago and Many Lands. In those days, most adults thought children's minds were like empty jars to fill up with learning. But Sophia thought differently. She thought children were more like gardens, already planted with seeds of possibility for learning and growing. And she thought a teacher's job was to provide the good soil and water and sunlight that a garden needs to grow. And in religious school, a teacher could help children grow in their spirit and their faith. And these are things that can only grow from within. People learn by experiencing the world for themselves, by feeling their own feelings, and seeing and touching and doing. And that is what Sophia Spaz believed. Just like this summer in the makerspace, right? We've been seeing and touching and doing. So when Sophia Foz wrote about her beliefs, the president of the American Unitarian Association was really impressed. So he asked her to talk to Unitarian religious educators, people like me, and Unitarian Sunday school teachers liked her ideas very much. And that is why when children and youth come here, we encourage them to see and touch and do and ask lots and lots of questions. <laughs> Like, what was that? <laughs> so when she was 82 years old, Sophia became a Unitarian minister. Her own life was a great example of her belief that every person in a congregation should continue to learn and grow, from the smallest child to the oldest adult. And Sophia Foz lived a long, long time, 102 years, I bet when you heard 82, you were like, oh, she was a minister for, nope, 20 years. <laughs> and she never stopped learning new things. If she were alive today and came to visit us, Sophia Foz would want to know about our experiences and how they helped us learn and grow. She would want to know what stories we've read lately and how they helped to awaken our spirits. She would want to know how we ask questions, seek answers, and learn from each other. So imagine how happy she would be to see us watering one another's seeds of spiritual growth here at OCUUC. All right, and now we're going to sing our children and youth and their leaders out to our religious education classes. <laughs> Oh 
Our meditation today are words from Douglas Taylor, entitled Meditation on Courage and Vulnerability. I am learning to let down my guard. We all know about the deep instinct to respond to difficulty and stress with either fight or flight, with force or swift retreat, with decisive attack or prompt withdrawal. When faced with stress or difficulty or challenge, I am learning to let down my guard. I'm learning to be vulnerable. I am seeking the courage to be open. I would have my vulnerability be a choice made from my courage rather than my fear. I would have my vulnerability be my strength. May my strength be not found as a hard shell of defense or a sharp weapon of attack. May my strength instead be found in an open stance of kindness and empathy, like a tree bending gracefully in the windstorm. May my strength be found in a willingness to join in the suffering of others, like a forest of trees together in a storm. May I choose to be receptive rather than protected, sharing rather than shielded. In this way, may I face my own suffering and the suffering of others with a nimble capacity to respond with compassion. In this way, may my vulnerability be an invitation to others to meet me in the open field with a yearning for understanding and peace. I know this is a risk. I know I may be hurt. I know things may not go well. But still, I will seek the courage to set aside the closed fist, the stinging retort, the barbed judgment of others. I will seek within myself the strength to stand exposed and unguarded before the world, in the wind, open to difficulty. Not because I cannot be any other way, but because I have chosen this better way. I am still learning to be vulnerable. I seek the courage to be so vulnerable. May I have others who can help me be so courageous. May my example serve others as well as myself. And may my strength be our strength in sharing this life openly with others. Please join me for a time of silent prayer, meditation, and reflection. <clears throat> So may it be, and amen.
When people ask me what I studied and I explain to them it's a Masters of Divinity, they actually almost always ask, what does that mean? And I find it's a little bit tricky to explain, mostly because I think the word divinity trips people up. We liken divinity to the, to the divine, as we should. But we also know that a master's degree is higher academia, so by definition, it feels like that should mean a graduate degree teaching us about the quality of being divine. Which I suppose isn't terribly far off, but I don't think it gets to the heart of it either. Because it's more than that, and somehow also less. Then I explain that one uh, specifically attends a seminary, not just an institution of higher learning like Harvard or Stanford, but one with the incredibly specific goal of educating ministers, priests, and other clergy, to which people always respond, you have to go to school for that? <laughs> well, yes and no. The necessity of a theological school differs based on one's faith community, though many do require it. Historically speaking, the first theological seminaries were created in part by future Pope Gregory XIII in the mid-ish 1500s, where he pledged to implement the reforms set forth during the 1561 Council of Trent. I'm not going to explain it, don't worry. But that did include seminaries which were run by Jesuit priests. Over the centuries, the term seminary has been used to denote a few different types of education. This has included general schooling for women specifically, as well as religious classes for Mormon high school students. In the end, though, the most prominent and frequent uses refer to professional clergy training, which got me wondering, why the heck do we call it seminary anyways? As it happens, the first usage of the word seminary is in 1542, but not in the way that we use it today. And I'm not quite sure, but I could have a pretty good guess how it came to its current usage. As a Middle English word, it is rooted in the Latin seminarium, which means seedbed. How wonderfully fitting, then, that the term used for a deep religious education is basically plant nursery. The interesting thing about seminary is that it is academic level work, but it is so much more than just academics. I read a saying early on, part of which said, seminary is like following a recipe. You follow the steps, you do it well, and at the end of your degree, you're ready to be a minister. And while that's technically true, it is far from that simple. For those of us who have never pursued a graduate degree, I'm not sure we can ever possibly be prepared for just how much reading there is to do. When you've read every chapter, every essay, every paper that you think you possibly can, surprise, that's just the reading for one class. And you have another two to 400 pages to get through the rest of the week. There's actually a style of skim reading expressly to address the mountains of reading. The sheer volume of work can be daunting, and there is a part of me that thinks that that much work is assigned for the sole purpose of weeding out the people who are not prepared to hunker down and do the work. Or worse yet, to weed out the people who are unable to commit for various reasons to that level of work. Grad school of any subject is no easy feat and the work required to complete such a degree takes careful planning. There are some days where winging it just won't cut it, not if you care about getting good grades. The classism and ableism of academia notwithstanding, if balancing a schedule isn't your forte before grad school, you'd better get good at it quick. I'm still working on that one. And that's the point of seminary in the end. It's about training the next generation of ministers, and on paper, that's really a lot of administration. Emails, phone calls, meeting after meeting. Balancing the schedule is one of the hardest skills, at least for me, to get into a habit. But still, it is more than that. It's more than the sermons on a Sunday, more than the invocations before meetings. It is deeper than the chats around cups of coffee and the facilitation of various groups. There are things I was entirely incapable of understanding until seminary, indeed, until actually doing ministry. 
Things that no matter how often I was told expect the unexpected, I could never possibly be adequately prepared. Like the day I baptized a dying man who reminded me so painfully of my late boyfriend. Like the day a new mother cried in my arms because she was finally healthy enough after four months of post-COVID rehabilitation to hold her infant daughter. And she was terrified she would hurt her. We are told this work will break us open in the most beautiful and excruciating ways, but there is no way to possibly understand what that means until ministry grabs you by the lapels and shakes the realities of humanity into you. Once again this week, I leaned into my colleagues on the subject. I asked them what they, as recent graduates or current students, wished our congregations knew about this thing called seminary what things they could only understand once embarked on that journey, and man, oh man, did they deliver. More than once, it was reiterated to me that this work is transformative. We should not, by any means, be the same person when we leave that we were when we began. We have to be willing to give ourselves over to the journey. It's a sacrifice, a crucible, we have to be willing to let go of everything, who we are, who we think we are, our expectations, our beliefs. We must be willing to forego the comfort of what is in favor of the unknown, and we must be willing to be shaped by it. We must be as water, able to shape ourselves to the vessel of the moment, and yet to still find ways of returning to ourselves, changed by our experience, but not defined by it. And those sacrifices aren't just emotional and spiritual, but practical. Seminary is an expensive process, with the majority of our new ministers entering the work with debt taken on during the degree process, which costs an upwards of 50 thousand dollars for the degree alone, not including the costs of outside classes and assessments. And while Unitarian Universalists work hard to pay our ministers a fair wage, I can promise you none of us gets into it for financial gain. But what this taught me was that ministry in many ways is unquantifiable. We have contracts outlining our expectations of our work, but there is so little that is seen outside of worship on a Sunday or our committee meetings. Every job I've worked up until now has been able to be marked by a tangible success. Happy customers, sales goals, good numbers, repeat clients. That's not the reality of this community. A minister may never know if their work mattered. The metrics for our successes are very much like the seed beds of the seminarium. We can plant the seeds of the work, tend it lovingly and with care alongside those of you in our congregations, but we may never see those seeds blossom into the gardens that we seek to tend. We do this work of soul bearing, of walking alongside the anguish and the brilliance of humanity, of pushing the bounds of the status quo, because it is the work that we are called to do. This kind of work is not for the faint of heart, but neither is our faith a faith for the faint of heart. To be a faith where we seek the best in and for all, to be a faith that is liberation-minded, has always and will continue to be a, a place that we can find ourselves among the change seekers of the world. We need a strength of will and fortitude of heart and we need ministers who will help foster that within each and every single one of you. And that's just a part of the work that we do with a gladness of spirit. I think the most important lesson I've learned from seminary, from my time here working with you all, is that the work is never over. It will take many iterations over the years, but it grows and changes with the people that we serve with and alongside. Our next ministries may bear similarities to our time with you here, but it will be a new experience just as much. My job isn't and never will be to tell anyone what to think, do, read, watch, or say. 
I don't suppose to know how anyone needs to be doing anything, and I don't think that's the purview of ministry, though there are clearly other faiths that disagree. My vocation, my calling as seminary has shaped it, is to be a source of comfort, of guidance, of care. My purpose in ministry is to bear witness to your joys and sorrows, to the burdens and successes of this world. I am not an ear to God, and nor do I ever want to be. But I am a vessel of love, a conduit for spiritual exploration and a call to liberation. And I hope that I can be an example for how each and every one of you has the capacity to do the same. There is nothing about me or my colleagues that is so exceptional and so special or particular that we are uniquely suited to the work of ministry. Seminary has simply taken the skills possessed and helped reframe them in ways that can help make them meaningful to guide you all on your journeys. But there is a ministry in us all, this I truly believe, and why shared ministry is a piece of Unitarian Universalism that I personally hold as a tenet of our faith. Ministry does not happen in a vacuum, and it requires the efforts of us all across the board in order to be successful. It's the continued return to covenant, the coming together as a community rooted in love, kindness, and compassion that allows for a ministry of the same. I had dinner with Reverend Jason Cook the other night, and I told him that I will be forever grateful that he recognized in me the capacity for ministry in my soul. You invited me into leadership in just the right way, at just the right time, and it allowed me to hear this call. You asked me to do a reading on a Sunday, and that invitation opened the door for me to find my way here today, and I am forever grateful for what you saw in me. He paused for a moment and smiled a little tightly, maybe a little guiltily, and said, I don't want to take that away from you, but I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> That's okay. It wasn't your moment. It was mine. But your ministry mattered. That day-to-day -day piece of the work for you was life-changing for me. What we say matters. So thank you for doing the work you do. When we say you are welcome here, we mean it. We mean it with our whole selves in all of the broken, imperfect, wild beauty of our individual divinity. It is not simply a welcome, but an invitation to make this church and this community our ministries, exactly what we here in the room and those out there need them to be. Because if there's one lesson you should take away from seminary, it's that we all have the capacity within us to share in gardening duties. There is no ministry without a community to serve, and it is my joy to plant the seeds of our future alongside all of you. So may it be, and amen.
Unitarian Universalist congregations are fully self-supporting, meaning that members and friends raise all funds from the op for the operating budget, ministries, and programs of the church. We are ever grateful for your gifts of time, treasure, and talent. OCUUC amplifies that spirit of generosity by sharing half of the plate we receive with an organization that shares our values. This month, we share the plate with Heartfelt, a nonprofit organization dedicated to saving lives from sudden cardiac arrest through early detection, education, increased public awareness, and has screenings to more than 55,000 student athletes, children, and adults, resulting in more than 1,000 lives being saved. There are multiple ways in which you can support the church and this organization. You can mail a check, you can go through our website, or you can use an app called Vanco Mobile. The choice is yours. All the information is on our website should you need it. As always, thank you for your generosity.
Okay, now please join us in singing We Gather Together, a song that puts our intentions into words and expresses our gratitude for the many gifts we share. Now is a time when we honor the important events in our lives. You are one, invited, one and all, whether you are a member, a friend, or a visitor, to participate in our weekly, weekly ritual of joys and sorrows. So, let's take a deep breath. Perhaps you come here today holding something close to your heart moments from the last days of, or hours that have struck you at your core. If you'd like to honor such a profound joy or sorrow, you are invited to do so. If you're a rumor, you're invited to come forward to light a candle. If you would like to share your joy or sorrow, you can write it down on the slip of paper provided uh, and hand it to me. If you are a Zoomer, you're invited to go ahead and write your joy or sorrow in the, in the chat. Once the rumors are done lighting the candles, I will read the joys and sorrows shared out loud as Marilyn Giss lights a candle for the Zoomers. As music is played, I invite you to silently offer your healing or celebration as you feel called and according to your own beliefs. Okay, we do have some joys and sorrows here, and, ah, and in the chat as well. So, Dolly Doran uh, has a joy, joy of joys. Uh, my Chinese acupuncturist has yet again successfully treated me for a one year malady. Mm, that's a good thing. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We have one from Jolene Ibanez, actually. <laughs> We have sorrow for heart, heartbroken for Lahaina, where I have found joy several times, and a joy. Chance seems to be happy with his local school, which we had tried to avoid for apparently no good reason. He's, play <laughs> He's playing electric bass in the marching band and a jazz band. Yes. Uh, Marilyn Giss has a joy for a beautiful and enriching uh, spirit rest retreat in, pa in Palos Verde at, at Daughters of Mary and Joseph Retreat Center. So grateful that she was able to participate. We have Lori Kay has a joy Lori had a lovely visit with Bonnie W. at Carmel Village. Her apartment looks out at a tall pepper tree. Very nice. And Patrick B. has a joy. Thank you, Mary S., for your thoughtful gifts. Francie Coleman has a joy and a sorrow. Uh, uh, flowers in honor of her mom, Stella Markovich's birthday. She loved the gladiolus flowers. And happy celestial birthday, mom. And yes, uh, thank you. OK. Ellen and Gabby Bla uh, Block have a sorrow. Dr. Betsy, okay, I'm good at handwriting here. Dr. Betsy Schuthether, uh who escaped and then the then Lahaina and her, husband. and her husband, who escaped the Lahaina fire with the author, uh, with the clothes on their back. Hmm. Oh. And E. Kilcher, who has a joy, she just got to greet another batch of third graders on Monday. So far, she is very pleased and grateful for all the care and accommodations from her principal. Also, please wish Elise a happy birthday on August 17th and Jacques on August 21st. Hmm. Uh, we do have some joys and sorrows here in the in the chat as well. Uh, a candle of concern. If you pray, please pray for Sarah Jones' husband, who will be having a prostate bi biopsy on Friday. Mm. And a candle of joy from. A candle of joy from Sarah as well. Uh, for new little orphan kitten, two weeks old, who found his way to their driveway and into their hearts. Bottle feeding has begun. <laughs> All right. Did I? Did I miss one? Yes, and also a sorrow from Linda Clark, who, who uh, our love, condolences, and strength to all who are affected by the tragedies on Maui. Mm. Let us hold in love all the joys and celebrations and all the hurts and sadness, both spoken and silent. Let our joys remind us to be thankful, our concerns remind us to hope, and our sorrows remind us to connect. Let all of these moments remind us that we are not alone. And please join Marilyn in a spirit of prayer or meditation.
Spirit of life, a God of many names, thank you for this precious day, for those close and those far away. May it be. Thank you. Okay, let us uh, join together as we extinguish the chalice of our flame, the flame of our chalice, (laughs) and say together, please, we extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. What am I talking about? Invitation, yes. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are made up of a congregation of people who all believe differently, and yet, when we gather together, we make up one loving community. We need not think alike to love alike. If you are a guest, a visitor, or someone who hasn't yet been known to us, I invite you to become a part of this beloved community. We encourage you to write in the chat, your name and where you're from, so that we can welcome you. If we have any, let me see if we have any. Or, we do have uh, we do have a microphone that we can go ahead and introduce any newcomers in the room. If you'd like to introduce yourself with your name and where you're from. Anyone? No. All right. If you'd like to know more about our church, including programming for our youth and children, please contact us at hello at ocuuc.org. And we will help you get connected. In addition, we invite you to sign up for our weekly email called The Blast at blast at ocuuc.org. We want everyone to feel a part of this beloved community, so please reach out and we will help you get connected. After the benediction, we'll have a short period where everyone can wave and say hello online. Uh, And with that, we do have some announcements. Yes, we do have some announcements coming up here. Uh, Some church events coming up. Uh, Circle suppers coming up on August 13th and 26th. If you'd like to see the blast for the details on that, a wild and scenic film festival is coming up on Saturday, September 30th. Tickets are on sale now. And of course, we have an all church family camp at Camp Devenable Pines uh, uh, on October 6th through 8th. Uh, And okay, and see, yes, definitely. We have someone to to help register us. And we are going to be celebrating Reverend Sean's 10 years with OCUUC. That'll be coming up on Saturday, October 14th, here in the courtyard. And of course, we do have a number of other uh, group and weekly meetings that are coming up uh, throughout the week uh, that are rotating on a regular basis. So if you'd like to go ahead and attend any of these, please feel free to do so. If you've never been to Camp De Beneville Pines, I highly recommend it. Seminary, more than anything, has served as a reminder that we are never truly alone. As long as we return to these gardens of our faith worth tending and loving, we will always have a place to live and be loved. May we always seek the transformation of change, May we seek ways to connect and grow together as one. 
May we always return to covenant in trust, and may we continue our journey together on the path to a beloved community for all. So may it be, amen, shalom, salam, namaste, and blessed be. Go now in peace. May the light within you be a blessing to the world.